Good morning. I am State Representative Julie Sandstead, and I want to thank you for joining me today on this Facebook Live Community Town Hall and Conversation. Um, it is my privilege to represent the districts of Hibbing, Nashua, Keekwatton, Chisholm, Floodwood, many other communities, townships across the 6A district. Um, I've started these, these community conversations and town halls virtually in hopes that people are uh, able to join, maybe not having to get out of their home or be afraid of COVID. Um, this is just a great way to be able to reach out and uh, give you a little bit of an update on what's happening down in St. Paul in the legislature and then to stay in contact with constituents like you uh, to hear what's on your mind, answer your questions, talk about concerns that you may have. Um, today, I also want to say thank you to Hitting Public Access. They are simulcasting this broadcast and if you happen to not be able to join us today or miss the event, uh, They've been really great about pushing it out and broadcasting at other times. So hopefully you can catch it then. Uh, people had the opportunity to submit questions ahead of time. If you did not have a question to submit then, but you're thinking of something now, feel free to pop it in the chat in Facebook and we'll try to get to those questions. And thank you um, to those who, who submitted your questions in advance. I'm looking forward to being able to answer those for you. And just a reminder that today's event is not a partisan event. This is really just supposed to be a very uh, polite conversation um, about what's happening and again to hear concerns. So I, I trust that we'll keep everything very civil and uh, I look forward to today's event. Um, to help keep us on track today, we have Minnesota House uh, staff member DJ Danielson working with us. He'll be feeding some of the questions to me and, and taking your questions. So good morning and welcome. Well, good morning, Representative Sandstead, and good morning to everyone joining us uh, at home, uh, watching either on Facebook or on uh, HPAT, uh, the Hibbing area there. Uh, how about we just start out with a broad overview of the session's status from your um, point of view here as we're, I think, approaching the midway point of the session right now. Yep, we are. Thank you for that. So this is the second year of the biennium. It is the shorter of the two sessions. Um, I think this session will go 14 weeks and we are just about at midpoint. Um, I felt like we had a little bit of a slow start in terms of moving bills along, but uh, one of the things that the state right now is having to face and, and decide how we're going to handle is a very unexpected surplus. Originally, we thought it was around $7 billion. It is now over $9 billion. Um, and certainly, we can get into this more in our conversation. A huge need across the state in many different areas. But now, how to, how to do, what are we going to take care of? How are we going to prioritize things? How are we going to use the surplus? What's appropriate? So that's been um, a lot of what's guiding the work that we're doing. Now that we're reaching the midpoint, we're starting to see bills move a little bit quicker. Definitely, um, we're pushing hard to hit the deadlines in our committees um, to make sure those are met. And then we're seeing single item bills move across the floor. And uh, I anticipate that as the session goes on, we'll be seeing more of that. Again, with a, an end date here in May, which will be <laughs> much sooner than later. <laughs> You had mentioned uh, bills are starting to move through the process there. How about you spend a couple minutes talking about some of the uh, specific items that uh, you're working on trying to get through the process? Thank you for that. So again, I mentioned this is the second year of the biennium. This is typically a bonding year. So if you look at my bill list, you will see that many of the bills I've introduced are bonding projects. And those are really going to be priorities for me, for my district, um, and the, dist the communities that I represent. One of them is going to be the um, Hibbing Public Safety Building. It's, it's going to be a combined fire police station. Um, we'll talk more about that, but that's a big bonding project coming through. I continue to work on issues like the Canisteo water level. Um, it's a, it's a, a public safety, public health issue actually, but it's moving through a bonding committee currently. I think we're gonna see some other work around that. Um, and then uh, Discovery Center has 
some requests. Many of the small communities have water infrastructure or sewer infrastructure projects that they're working on. Those are oftentimes a phased project and we're at diff you know, different levels of that. We're in different parts of the phases. Um, so those are moving along. Um, we're really fortunate the the house bonding tour came up to the Iron Range this past summer and viewed many of those projects or heard presentations about those projects firsthand, which is, is very helpful um, in terms of getting your project across the finish line at the end. They have, they have a really good idea of what's happening and, and how necessary these projects are. Um, for the city of Hibbing, I've introduced a bill. Hopefully we'll be able to get a, a boys and girls club in our community, something that is much needed. That's one of the pieces of legislation I'm working on. I have some different um, education related things. I, I just had a great hearing the other day on transportation sparsity. Uh, this is a funding area for school districts, especially in the areas that I represent that is very critical. Um, most of our public schools are experiencing declining enrollment as a result of COVID or other reasons, maybe a loss of population on the Iron Range as a whole. Um, and the school districts are funded on these uh, for, for transportation on a per pupil basis. So what happens is you lose students and your funding is reduced, but the square footage of your transportation route is not reduced. The cost does not go down. And we certainly know right now uh, the gas prices are more than they've been. So this, this is really critical funding to rural districts like we see on the Iron Range. Um, in so many areas. Another piece of uh, legislation I'm very hopeful to get across the finish line this year is, I call it my polar vortex bill. This is a bill that is the result of what we experienced in 2021 with the polar vortex. We had five days where um, it was very cold and our utility costs uh, increased significantly to a point where most residential payers could not afford their increase and businesses the same thing. Um, many of those people had to go on payment plans that lasted 12 months or, or some, some amount of time. Um, it was great that we were able to do that and help them with a payment plan, but uh, I feel it was not appropriate that any Minnesotan was gouged the way we were gouged, whether it was on the Iron Range or in other parts of the state. So what my bill does is it allows for a refundable tax credit uh, for ratepayers, whether you're residential or businesses that had an overage that was passed on to them. And hopefully they'll be able to recoup that money. And in the meantime, uh, the state continues to work on some price gouging laws, things like that to ensure this doesn't happen again. Really, this is a federal, it stems from a fed, federal level um, I tried to work with our federal colleagues to get something going and with everything that was happening last year, there just wasn't an appetite at the federal level to really resolve this issue. So I'm hoping with the surplus, I totally think it's appropriate to use some of the surplus to give back to the ratepayers that were gouged through this. And this is specific to municipal utilities. Um, that's a lot of what I'm working on. <laughs> All right, and then I know a lot of the work at the Capitol this time of year is done in committees, uh, and you serve on several of those, including the Education Finance Committee, of which you're vice chair, the Higher Education Committee, the Industrial Education and Economic Development Committee, and then the Redistricting Committee, as well as the Subcommittee on Legislative Process Reform. Uh, I'll you spend just a couple minutes talking about uh, what those committees are up to this time of year. Absolutely. Thank you for those uh, those introductions. So the first committee I'll talk about is the Education, Finance, and Policy Committee. Um, I am the vice chair of that committee. I have been on this committee since I was elected into the legislature my first year in 2017. Um, I, my background is a teacher. I've been a teacher for 28 years um, in public education, so I feel right at home in this committee. We are hearing without a doubt a couple of broad overtones for education. One of the one of the umbrella areas, if you will, is student mental health and staff mental health. Um, this has been a growing concern uh, in our region, not just in schools, but in our region. However, when you go into the schools, um, we're really seeing it in our students. 
um, coming in with very complex issues, complex needs. And we are seeing a shortage of these of workers to help with these types of things. Um, without a doubt, we need more school counselors, more in-school social workers, school nurses, um, chemical dependency counselors, counselors of, of all sorts. Uh, right now, depending on what area you see, some public schools have, you know, 700 students or 1,000 students to one counselor. That ratio just is not a sustainable ratio for the needs that our students are coming in with. And these are not just high school students. We're talking about pre-K and K students that need support services. Um, so we're hearing a loud outcry across the state for more support in that area. Um, another loud outcry is just funding in general. We have to fund public education. Right now, public education's funding is not tied to any inflationary increase, and we all know costs continue to go up. So with this surplus, hopefully, um, there's certainly an expectation that something will be done for school districts in terms of funding. One of the things that the school districts are seeing across the board, again, I mentioned it earlier, is declining enrollment. Um, much of this was a result of COVID, and it was unforeseeable. It was unpredictable, unforeseeable. And so with the declining enrollment, there has been decreased funding and the needs continue incre to increase, but the budget continues to decrease in every, every area. So this is problematic. Um, we are, we're hearing quite a bit from our support personnel, our ESPs. Um, these are critical staff people in our building. They are, they walk right alongside an educator and they make as much difference in the life of students as the educator is making. Um, and these people are, first of all, again, we need more of them, but their rate of pay is um, very low, too low. It's not a living wage. It's, we have uh, people in my district, there's one individual in ESP who after working two weeks has to write the district a $50 check in order to have health coverage. So they work for two full weeks, their entire paycheck goes to health coverage and then they have to write a $50 check supplemental. Um, it's not a living wage. And then there's no predictability in these people coming back. When you have such a low wage, um, you have to support your own families and take care of your own needs. And if you can't do that, with the assurance your job is going to be there next year. These are people that will oftentimes be here for a year and maybe have to leave for something higher paying another year. So we are hoping to be able to do something on that. Um, another piece of that that I would really like to see, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do this, but I would like to, I, I, I would personally like to see school hourly workers be included in unemployment insurance. So on the months that they are not working in a school building, they could apply for unemployment um, insurance. They could then know that they would possibly have a job coming back um, in the fall. This includes ESPs and bus drivers and custodial staff, different people like that. Um, I think that would be a good thing to help stabilize the workforce in those areas. Um, and I had one other thing I wanted to say on that. Well, it, we'll come back to it, but this is this is just a real critical piece of our school um, picture. We have a shortage of teachers. We're hearing um, how are we going to take care of that problem, and we can maybe get into those issues a little bit more later on. But that's one of the broad areas that we're looking at too. How are we going to entice teachers into the profession? How are we going to um, maintain those teachers once they're into the profession? So let me move on to the other committees because I could sit and talk about this one all day long. Um, another committee that I sit on is the higher education. This is my second year serving on that committee. Higher education is really focusing around um, student aid, uh, scholarship, um, funding for our students, sustaining our students, supporting our students. And again, there's mental health needs. There's food stability that we're hearing about. Um, the university and college systems have come with their requests um, on either bonding projects or other projects again. Um, and higher ed is one of those areas that historically goes underfunded. Uh, from a state perspective, the, the legislation says two-thirds, one-third in um, tuition rates, and we haven't been able to keep up with that. So we keep kind of addressing how can we 
how can we do this um, without passing more on to our students. Another committee I serve on is the Industrial Ed and Economic Development uh, Finance and Policy Committee. This has been a really wonderful committee. Um, we hear such a broad perspective of bills coming through that. This year we've looked at broadband. Broadband is an uh, issue that continues to be um, a significant need in, in my region. Um, we're improving, but we're not there yet. It's not, it's not a solid piece of infrastructure that everybody can count on. And that inhibits economic development. Not having that infrastructure in place is really um, kind of a, a downturn for, for companies that are looking at maybe in coming into a new region or something. If you don't have that in place, it's a little bit of a distance for coming. So we need to continue to work on that. Like I said, it is improving, but um, slowly. And hopefully with this surplus, we can make big significant uh, changes in that area. I did work on the redistricting committee. I think for the most part, our work is done. Um, I've had many, many questions from people. What is this? What are these new maps about what's happening? Um, redistricting is something that has to happen statutorily every 10 years. And uh, it's based on population. It's based on the census. So this summer when people were knocking doors, last summer when people were collecting data on where you live and who you are and all that stuff, ultimately it, it filters down into the process of redistricting. So the new maps are out and um, we weren't able to take care of that uh, through the House and Senate. There was not a joint agreement, so it went to the courts. The courts came out with maps. And, and uh, if you have further questions, we can talk about that later. But that's one of the committees I worked on. Much of our work on that committee was done after session because the data that we needed to do our work was late in coming to us. So that was a, that was a busy time after session, post session. And then I sit on a subcommittee for legislative reform um, or legislative process and reform. Um, that one we don't meet as often. It's a little bit quieter, but five committees in all, that's a, it's a lot of work in a session. It keeps me very busy. All right. Well, how about we uh, get into some questions here? Um, and a reminder, if you uh, would like to offer a question, feel free to drop it in the chat on Facebook. How about we just start off with uh, a topic that you already alluded to a couple times in uh, the comments thus far. Um, we recently heard the new economic forecast with a $9.25 billion budget surplus. This is a record amount, and there are lots of ideas about how to move forward. What's your plan for a supplemental budget this session? Yes. Um, when I came into session, I was thinking it was seven point some billion. Our, our most recent forecast puts us over $9 billion. Number one, I want to make sure that real tangible relief and results are going into um, our population. I absolutely think without a doubt, we need to do something for our frontline workers up front. And I'm, I'm, I'll be very clear on that especially our healthcare workers. We went through a pandemic, again, something unforeseen. It impacted all of us. I think many of us are going to still be processing that for many years to come, but without a doubt, historically, this has had a significant impact on those frontline workers, our healthcare workers, who um, put themselves in places of risk for other people in ways I can't even articulate. So. I do think it's appropriate to find some kind of, uh, in, it's, money is never going to be enough of a thank you to them, but um, we should be doing something to recognize those people. Right now, the House has passed a hundred, or uh, a one billion, excuse me, one billion dollar um, bill to go to our frontline workers. The Senate has yet to do anything on this. And I know that, that there is a, a billion dollars in the governor's budget. I know the House is already in the House budget. We have passed that bill. What our workers do not deserve is silence from the Senate. So we have to keep working towards that. I think it's appropriate to use the surplus for that. Another thing that we need to use the sur surplus for, and it falls right on the heels, is paying back our unemployment insurance fund. Um, that is, is something that we need to do to make that fund whole, to stabilize. Um, I often think about, you know, I'm glad it was there 
there were many people who took uh, advantage, I don't want to say advantage of it, but needed to utilize that with COVID. And it was there for a reason and they had access to it to stabilize their families and get through some difficult times. So that was good. Um, those times aren't done. This is not the last difficult time we're going to see. And we need to be prepared for whatever comes next. I think about my region, Hipping Taconite has 4,000 jobs um, that right now, I don't know what's gonna happen in a year's time. There's no more of a, a plan for additional taconite than there was when I got into the legislature. Those people could be in need of accessing this fund in a short time. I wanna make sure it's there for them to help um, until they have another plan, until we know what comes next. So that is an absolute priority. With the additional money too, I think we could be doing something for our aging community and uh, those that are living on fixed income. One of the things I forgot to mention in bills that I had, I have a couple of tax bills dealing with social security uh, benefits and social security and specifically in terms of property tax, giving them a little bit of a break, exempting social security altogether or um, just qualifying income as your adjusted gross income uh, there's two different bills moving. Both of them are, are, are important. And ultimately what both of those bills do, should they be passed, will uh, put a little bit more money back into um, the 65 and older or social security age people to use for access to healthcare for themselves or the cost of prescription drugs or whatever they need it for. But again, everything we see right now is becoming more expensive, not less expensive. It's time to give back and do that. The polar vortex, again, is another primary thing for me. I want to see that money go back into the pockets of those that were impacted by this. Um, I hope Minnesota can do better and will do better in terms of price gouging laws so it doesn't happen. And then, of course, there's all the other areas that are so significant. Education, there's never a lack of um, need in those buildings. I've articulated it. I don't sit on the health and human service committees, but of course, there's all sorts of issues there. We look at um, some of our home care workers and, and those that have waivers, different things like that, uh, our ESPs again in education. There are, there are so many people across the state doing critical work, life-sustaining work that are making minimum wage or just a fraction above and you cannot sustain families on that. I would like to see some of the money go back um, into that. Um, oh, can we talk about roads and bridges? <laughs> There's a few needs there. <laughs> uh, that would be a great time to take care of some of the really significant needs that we have. And we see it, you know, it's statewide. There's uh, bridges that really need addressing. There are roads and um, bad state, bad state all across our state. So I think we can make huge improvements in that area as well with some of the surplus. These are historic one-time monies. I don't think we're gonna see this again. I think this money right now overall should be used to help stabilize what has um, been impacted or strengthen whatever is like critical at this time. As the state continues to grow and we, we move on and we move into you know future bienniums, there's always going to be budgets that we will set in need, but we have an opportunity right now to make investments that will help stabilize and shore up our economy and our state, our infrastructure, our education systems, our healthcare system today. And I think that's what we should do. Question here uh, from a wellness money coach in the district. Uh, interesting question. I'd love to see financial literacy required in elementary, high school, and college. It's definitely someone, definitely something everyone has to deal with in life and so many aren't equipped to manage it. Uh, and constituent says, I'd love to know how I can be helpful in implementing this in our region, county, and state. Uh, thoughts on uh, financial literacy in schools? Awesome question. Thank you so much for that. So I think that this would be a wonderful thing to have our students start working with at a very early age. As a mother of three, <laughs> I am constantly trying to teach my own children about financial literacy and responsibility, and, and it's tough. Um, the hard thing becomes mandates if you mandate it or it becomes um if you have to require it to be part of the curriculum that that just there's limited time it, that's where it becomes a little more difficult uh, i definitely think it is a worthy cause i support it i think the uh, great place to start here 
is with your school boards to make it a priority and then move it up the up the chain kind of like that. I know we have this conversation in the state or at the state level um, often. I think it was Representative Sandell maybe last year that had a couple bills around financial literacy. Representative Her has a bill moving this year. Um, I believe that gives grants to the Department of Education to help with this. Um, to incorporate it into curriculums for districts that are wanting it. So there is some help out there for it. It's getting your district to kind of apply for it and go after that and make it a priority at a local level. But I think it's very, very worthy. Uh, every morning when I get up, when I'm home and I watch the local news, they have a financial advisor on teaching some of the basic skills. And if they're putting that out on the morning news, I definitely think this is something we should be talking about in our, in our classrooms. Earlier, you had mentioned uh, the polar vortex last year, but broadly a question here about energy. How can we lower energy costs during this period of uncertainty? Yeah, let's get rid of winter. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. We can't do that, but uh, it would be nice some days. How can we lower energy costs? I think we just have to be wise consumers of our energy. Um, certainly, the state needs to have some uh, safeguards in place so we're not gouged like we were. Uh, I think, too, that we can... Um, we can look to find a balance like, well, first of all, again, being wise consumers of it, you know, to lower your own energy costs, uh, don't run your water as often, turn off lights you're not using, all that common sense stuff that we do. But then we can look at long term, sometimes we need to look at long term investments or, or immediate investments for long term returns. Um, there are energies that are cheaper, there are energies that are more efficient. Um, certainly down at the house, we're having some, I'm not part of the energy committees, but there are robust conversations going on about green energy, solar energies, wind energies, there's hydro energies we're talking about. There's, there's many different things happening. Um, I do think that wherever we can reduce a carbon footprint, we should and could, but that is not in my mind completely eliminating fossil fuels. Uh, there's a place for all of that. The polar vortex was a prime example where we needed to fall um, back on those things. If we had been wholly independent on uh, solar or wind energy during those days, we really would have been in a worse condition. So how can we save money on that? Um, we, can, we can just look at ener energy efficiency, maybe in the vehicles that we're buying, um, in the homes that we're building. Um, I, I think about even, I have a sister who has a very old farmhouse down in Hastings and they have retrofitted pretty much everything with solar right now and they're able to sell that energy back to their co-op. So there are things that can be done. Um, it isn't a one size fits all depending on where you live in the state though. Another question uh, regarding the surplus, uh, Governor Walls has stated several ideas about sending checks out for the surplus that Minnesota has in its coffers. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on um, rebate checks or, or Walls yeah, checks, I, really, I believe he's branding? Yeah, them. I have really mixed feelings about that, to be honest. I'm not necessarily in favor of that. And I, I do think the surplus should go back. However, I want, it, I want to be very clear, this surplus isn't a result of overtaxing, so it doesn't necessarily, it hasn't come from everybody. Um, what we see such a significant surplus from is really corporations that just excelled, that thrived during COVID, had historic gains. Um, they really did well while many of us were struggling. That's not the story for everybody. So the majority of our surplus is from that. I'd like to give back again in meaningful ways uh, that make an impact for everybody. Um, you know, I, I was around when uh, Jesse Ventura had his checks that went out and, and it was helpful because I think I bought a pack of diapers, which was great, but you know, it, it didn't make a big difference in my life. It didn't change the trajectory my family was on. And, and I'm confident these checks are going to have the same impact. They're not going to change anybody's trajectory. But collectively, if we could put them towards an impro improved road or bridge or into an education system or our health care system or reducing um, pharmacy costs, yeah, that makes a difference. So I don't know. I'd like to see the surplus used to benefit everybody. 
one-off checks might not be the best way to do it, in my opinion. All right, uh, shifting back to a topic you had briefly touched on in your uh, discussion about bonding this year, how do we fix the Canisteo mine pit issue? It's a big threat <laughs> to the surrounding communities. Well, if I had that answer, we would have taken care of this a long time ago. I think we're making huge progress on this. Um, for at least 20 years, for anybody listening who's not familiar with this project, this, is, this has been a concern for well over 20 years. And for over 20 years, we've been going at it through bonding processes. And tens of millions of dollars have gone out to the DNR to address the issue. Um, and ultimately, we don't have a solution that's going to be long term. We are at a point where we have a long term solution. We have an outflow system, we have a path, we have agreement um, for or from the, the lease owners of the property that this this contraption, for lack of a better word, would would span or go across. Um, and we're doing it in a clean and healthy way. Uh, and now at the end of the day, the DNR has said this isn't their project. It's really a local government project. That really threw a curveball in who's taking care of this project. We always thought this was really a DNR thing. Long story short, I have created um, a general fund bill in the same amount as the bonding request. So if we can't get it done through bonding, we can try to get it done through the general fund. Again, a great way of using surplus dollars. If we can't get it done through the just a general fund appropriation, one-off type of bill. I'm also looking at creating what I'm calling a legacy mine account. Um, the Canisteo is just one of three pits in the area that have real concerns to public safety, either in terms of high water levels or toxicity or different things like that. So even if we're able to get the Canisteo taken care of, there's going to be another issue that comes up quickly, you know, there's three of them kind of knocking at our door. So the solution I'm looking for is longer term. I'm looking to create an account that will have the funding available to um, whoever, you know, is going to be authorized to handle the situation uh, for immediate access. So, so we don't have to worry about is a community going to flood. If you need immediate relief, immediate assistance, that fund is there. And I've been working um, with a, a very large stakeholder group on this, including the governor's office, who seems to have an appetite for a longer term solution. Um, I think that we're gonna get some ground on this and that they'll, I think we're gonna be able to get this done. I'm very hopeful. I know that we have really pushed the limits with mother nature and uh, I don't feel like we should push it anymore. So we have at least a three legged approach right now, three bills that are going to be there. I've heard that the DNR has another one for an emergency pumping situation. Again, short-term solution, it's not gonna take care of the problem long-term, it will prevent a disaster perhaps. So that could be a fourth leg to the situation. The solution ultimately is gonna come from all of the communities, the stakeholder groups, Itasca County, the Western Mine, uh, or the Western Masaba Mine Planning Board, the, the individual communities, the school trust lands, the, um, the DNR all coming together, the, the IRRRB who's been involved in some of this, all of us coming together now as a large stakeholder group with a unified voice saying, we have to have this taken care of and we're all working together instead of this entity doing one thing and another entity doing something else and all trying to make it happen. But collectively, I think we're gonna be able to do it and that's our approach this year. Staying on the topic of capital investment, but something uh, completely different. Uh, what would be housed in the proposed new public safety building in Hibbing? And then some other follow-up questions here with that. Where are those things currently housed? Where will it be located? How much will it cost? And what is housed in the building across from the planetarium? Uh, thoughts on the proposed public safety building in Hibbing? Yeah, this is a priority for me this session. Thank you for the question. Um, this is a $22 million request for a new public safety building. My understanding of what would be housed in that building would be our police, our fire, any kind of emergency response, uh, regional community um, needs. And, and there is a sentence in there, I think it says other regional community needs. So it's kind of broad, there could be 
space perhaps for training. Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, if there is a defined definition for what the intent of that language was. Where it's going to be located, I'm not 100% positive. I've heard different locations that really comes down to more of a local decision than something that we have to define at the state. Um, we're doing this right now because uh, we have some structural issues with the fire hall itself. I know that one of the things that we saw on the tour is the doors didn't open. Uh, you know, you went to get your fire trucks out and the doors went open. That's a problem in responding. Um, right now, that facility does not have equitable uh, like locker rooms for female firefighters or EMTs response personnel. Um, that's just not something that should be the situation in 2022. That's not acceptable. Our police station right now is on, it's a lease. The building and the property is being rented or leased. We don't even own it. So uh, this facility would house our police as well. And to the last part, I think of what is on the fairgrounds, is that what the question was, DJ? The uh, planetarium, what's across from that? Oh, I'm not sure which building that's referred to. There are a couple different buildings on each side and either way, I couldn't tell you, I don't know. I know Public Works is in, in part of what one of the buildings are. I'm not sure which building they're referring to. There's another building. I don't know what would be in that one right now. Uh, I'm going to shift here to the Facebook chat. A couple of comments regarding uh, stressing a reserve uh, for future needs. And uh, one comment saying, with one time money, I would hope we would retain a strong reserve and that we would use the dollars to invest in important needs and not give a few hundred bucks back to taxpayers. Please invest in education, healthcare, and infrastructure. And then a, a question regarding that. Uh, it concerns me that Minnesota... Uh, wants to use all of the surplus. I would be more comfortable if much was left in reserve. What's your opinion? I certainly do not want millionaires to benefit from untaxed social security. You know, one of the questions earlier was talking about financial literacy, and this is an exact implication <laughs> of why we need to have it. Yes, I think it's important to have something left in reserve. That's just wise for your home budgets as well as it is for the state. So with our surplus, I would certainly like to leave something in reserve. However, there are significant needs that I do think we could spend down some of the surplus on that would be meaningful. And for the person who heard this question, I don't know if you or that asked this question, um, there was a question earlier about walls check, should they go back? And my, my short answer was, I think there's a better way to do that. So it sounds like we're kind of in agreement on that one. Question here from someone interested in the arts. Uh, Minnesota Citizens for the Arts is seeking passage of House File 2637, which is a bill for uh, calling it Cultural Community Restart Grants. As a board member with regional arts organizations, I can attest firsthand to the need to support this bill. The pandemic continues to have a severe impact to the Masaba Symphony Orchestra and the Masaba Concert Organ uh, Association. Each organization could continue operations with this financial assistance. Absent this support, MCA with a 75 year history of providing high quality performances could disband in 2023. Uh, Representative Sandstead, your thoughts on cultural community restart grants? 100% support. <laughs> um, as a former member of the Masada Symphony Orchestra myself, um, I know how important these grants are to be able to do the work that we do and, and perform uh, the way we've been able to perform. And when you can infuse even small communities with, su with such a high standard of art, um, the arts are so critical to who we are as human beings. And certainly they play such a significant part in our communities. They help to round us out. Um, we have so many mental health issues and struggles. Having something as beautiful as the arts that people can relate to and um, relax to and identify with is critical. In it. And, and we understand that, especially down in the metro, we're so um, rich with these opportunities, but they're not that rich in greater Minnesota all the time. So, so um, grant opportunities like this in this house file are so important to making sure small town communities, greater Minnesota has an access to the high quality arts that other people 
take for granted. Um, I'm a huge proponent of the arts, so you can count on me for that one. Do you support the Huber Wood Products plant in Cohasset? I do. The Huber Woods Product um, plant is a, a newer plant starting up. I, I think it's a great location in northeastern Minnesota, given our uh, natural resource economy. We are so rich with trees, water, timber, uh, minerals, and this, this plant um, is located perfectly for so much of the timber industry. Um, it's jobs, you know, it, it's, it's jobs other than mining, which we have just become so dependent on and, and we're struggling in that area. So this is really some, some economic development that still uses the resources that Northeastern Minnesota has. They're good paying jobs. Um, and I do think it's important that we can and continue to have, you know, companies like this invest in Northeastern Minnesota and build out our economy because we need, we are definitely in a position where we need to do that. Yes, so I do. Another question here on the regional economy up on the range. Uh, now that the mineral leases have been terminated for Masaba Metallics, what's next for the former SR site in Nashwalk? And how long do you expect cliffs to keep North Shore mining idled? That's a great question. Um, I have been pushing so hard to have a conversation about what comes next. So right now, we are in an appeals window. Um, and I think we have, I think it goes until April. I have to look at my dates, but I think it's up until about April. So I have been calling the DNR, pushing the DNR, pushing the governor's uh, office, pushing the executive council to have the conversation about what comes next. Can we be talking to other companies? Can we start developing a plan B for what happens? And the long and short was, you know, while we are in this appeals process, we, we the government, cannot actively seek out uh, potential investors. If potential investors want to reach out and, and make a suggestion, present an offer, they're welcome to do that. But while we're in this still appeals window, um, as, a, as part of the court hearing before, the government cannot do that. I don't know what stands to come for that. I, I would still like to say, I think Cliffs is the right, I will say, I still think Cliffs is the right um, company to come in and take care of that. But I think we may have lost our window of time with them, to be totally honest. Um, I'm very concerned about that. Again, 4,000 jobs and hitting uh, that would have been timely, very important. Um, maybe we can do something still, we'll see. Uh, as far as how long will the North Shore be idled? I have heard that it could be up to August possibly, but I don't know. We have to um, figure out what comes next. We just really have to have that conversation with them. And I know that there's some internal struggles with the, the trust going on and that's really for them to figure out. I'm not sure the government's gonna get involved in that one. Question here, where are we with the wavered service homemaker uh, service that has not seen an increase in over seven years? Is it going to be included in the individual in-home services without training category this year? Um, any so, thoughts to offer there? Yeah, first of all, I wanna be clear. I don't sit on the health and um, human service committee. So I'm not as up to speed on a lot of these waiver concerns, but I can say very broadly, I am very supportive of an increase in the waiver um, reimbursements. I think it's House File 3524 that is currently moving uh, regarding the homemaker waiver. And I think that this is a priority bill with um, uh, the homemaker services in general, or the Home Care Association, Minnesota Home Care Association. Um, again, these are some of the workers I mentioned early on that are doing really life-sustaining work. Uh, they are the ones that are able to keep people in their homes and assist them and help them, but they're not even, they're barely making minimum wage, which is not acceptable. So I'm very supportive of an increase and I hope to see this get done this session. Interesting question here. Will you please get hemp unregulated? It's a plant that would benefit my small homestead greatly. The seed will provide 150 gallons per acre of biofuel for my tractor. 
the fiber I can use as hemp uh, use in hempcrete and as bedding for my critters. It's highly nutritional for my family and the critters, and it sequesters carbon at a rate of 4.2 tons per acre. I don't want to pay the thousands in fees, allow inspectors on my land, and let them decide whether or not the crop gets destroyed. Uh, thoughts on hemp regulations? Well, I think that there is a misunderstanding of what hemp is in general. Hemp is very different than marijuana. And as far as hemp as an industry, I'm very supportive. I mean, this is, it's in clothing, it's in textiles, it's in ropes, it's in uh, exactly what this individual described. I would like to see advancements made on that. And I know that there are lobbyists out there kind of pushing uh, last year, I don't remember which bill number it was from a year ago, but we saw some hemp bills to kind of get this industry up and going um, and utilizing hemp as, as a plant-based material. So yes, I would be supportive of that. All right, next question here. Uh, you touched on uh, rebates a little bit earlier, but this question comes from a bit of a different perspective. So I'll uh, ask it, when can the taxpayers expect an income tax rebate or credit against taxes? When will adjustments to the tax code be made so we do not continue to create huge surpluses? I, I think what we need to understand is that the huge surplus, again, is not a result of overtaxation. Um, there are probably areas, there are areas that we could do a little bit better on social security taxes. One of the areas right now that I'm looking at making some reductions and, and, and improvements on. Um, so we can look at those types of things that I think are appropriate. Again, our surplus though, this historical surplus is really from large corporations, large businesses having outstanding years. The S&P 500 last year, I think, I, I wrote down some notes, rose 22% in the fourth quarter, grew 22% in the fourth quarter, and saw an over 50% increase in 2021. So these are, again, while many of us were struggling uh, during COVID, some people, some companies were thriving, having just historical gains. Um, and that's much of where, that's probably where the majority of our surplus came. So every year we have some kind of a tax bill. Uh, every year modifications are made to that tax bill. You can expect to see them at the end of this legislature or this legislation, this legislative session. Um, I suspect we will have a tax bill and you will see those you know, implemented for the, the upcoming tax session. Um, specifically what's gonna happen in there, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen in all of our, you know, uh, budget areas, but I do think it's reasonable to expect a tax bill and probably a bonding bill out of this session. A timely question here uh, based on global events. Uh, do you support the proposed sanctions against Russia with regards to Ukraine? I do. I do. I do. Will there be additional dollars invested in E12 education this session using some of the surplus dollars? Assuming that we're able to uh, work with the House and Senate on this, the House is an absolute yes. We are investing for sure. And in broad areas, again, teacher recruitment, uh, teacher retention, ESPs, hourly workers, children's mental health, staff mental health, on and on and on. We are building our budget. We are building our bills um, all around those areas. The difficult part is working having the Senate join us and matching up in some areas. Right now, the word that we're hearing is basically the Senate is saying, no, we're not gonna invest. We did our budget investments last year. We set a budget for education. We are going to live by that budget. Even with the surplus, they're not willing to take into account some of the, like I mentioned earlier, unforeseeable, unforeseeable uh, decreases in student population, which affects the budget and different things like that. They're saying they've budgeted, that's that, end of story. So it's gonna be hard to get something to move. I am hopeful by the end of session that there will be agreement in, in broad areas. I don't know that we're going to see one-off bills, but I think if we can coalesce around mental health or teacher retention or um, our hourly workers helping to stabilize that workforce, I'm hoping we can do that. 
any idea how and when the LCCMR, which is the uh, Legislative Co Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, I think I got all those uh, letters in that there, uh, will decide on funding of current proposals? So uh, again, not on that committee. Um, the LCCMR funds come from our state lottery proceeds and uh, there is always an abundance of requests coming out of that that committee. I, I don't know when the final plan will be or how that will be arrived at, but I know they have a meeting coming up March 23rd, I believe it is. So hopefully we'll have more information. Maybe at my next town hall, I can give you a better update on what happens there, but March 23rd, not too far off, is when they'll be meeting again and hopefully have a little more information on that. Question here uh, coming in from the Minnesota Women's Press joining us here uh, for today's event. Uh, we have been interested in how areas of the state are offering supportive community housing and what is a crisis not only for affordable housing, but those recovering from addiction, dealing with mental health issues and more. We understand Hibbing has a strong new well-being housing development. How do you see these needs statewide being addressed with upcoming policy and investment? Again, not sitting on committees directly, but the need, it, the conversation is familiar to all of us. Um, definitely uh, housing issues across the state are a major issue. And when you mention um, special areas, mental health areas, different things like that, those areas of housing are even less available as you get into greater Minnesota, different places like that. I think the conversation um, is definitely a very healthy and robust conversation on these areas. I know that, again, the area of mental health as a whole is something that we are hearing about in pretty much every committee, whether you're in education or health or public safety or you name it, we're, we're hearing about that. So we're seeing more investments in housing. It's uh, one of the things um, in my region that we definitely have a need for. Uh, broad, broadly, we have a, a significant need for different types of housing. Um, I am very happy to hear about this facility that should be coming to Hibbing. There's a need for this um, across the range and it's, it's good to have it here located in Hibbing and, and to build some of that up. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you is how is it being addressed? not sitting on the committee, I can't tell you what their specifics are. I would assume that there's a lot of grants going in, uh, bonding requests. I know I've seen many bonding requests. Uh, I'm not on the bonding committee this year, but last year, there, excuse me, the biennium before I was, and we saw many of the same type of housing requests, the needs going through bonding committees. Um, so the conversation is very alive and they are trying to be addressed through different committees. And, and we, we're making progress, not often as, as fast as I would like to, but we are making progress. Time for a few more here before we have to wrap up. Uh, the last time the Minnesota Public Libraries, not the Arrowhead Library System, had any legislative action was 2011 when the Republicans cut the mandated state levy 10% for Minnesota Public Libraries. With the budget surplus and the 11 years since any positive levy action, uh, because so many state public libraries are operating on such tight budgets. Representative Sandstead, are you aware of any legislative increases in mandated levies for Minnesota public libraries? Again, uh, not aware of any mandates to levies, um, but certainly requests. We heard um, in, in just our E12, K12 education, we heard a bill not too long ago um, just this past week, actually, about our library systems and and how critically uh, underfunded really they are, and how they're they're making ends meet any which way they can. Um, and what I think I thought it was a great presentation by the people who gave it. Uh, you don't really think about your um, public library as being such a hinge point or critical access point to employment or different things like that, but really it is, you know, um, especially in greater Minnesota, many places don't have broadband and, and there's an individual, and I think this was actually a Metro person who was telling the story. They were able to go, um, they wanted to apply for a job, but it had to be done online. They didn't have access to it online with the internet 
um, issues that they had, they were able to go to the public library. The public library is what helped them apply for the job that they ultimately ended up getting and, and things were good. But whether it's healthcare, whether it's jobs, whether it's education, um, our libraries are critical, critical. And, and the funding, you know, hasn't been there. There hasn't been historic investments to their funding. So this, again, would be an appropriate time to use some of the money to help stabilize and shore up what has really been struggling for a while. I'm hoping that we can do something for our libraries. What are you doing to support police and maintain public safety in Minnesota communities? First of all, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our police, EMS, responders across the board. I'm, um, this has been a very controversial issue in the last couple of years, but I'm wholly and totally supportive of our police, especially what I'm seeing up in greater Minnesota. Um, I think that some of the things that we can do is continue to support them. Uh, there should be opportunities to incent people to come into the profession to help them get their foot in the doorway. I know that there's a couple bills around that moving. Um, recruitment uh, bonuses, retention type of benefits, I think are all very important. And those are things that we can be doing to support our police. So I'm hoping that we can see some of those measures moving. Um, and I would support all of that. Right, you know, yesterday we had a conversation about police and it used to be, and I'm going to make a parallel here with teachers, it used to be that, you know, for one position open, you could have hundreds of applicants and now you're lucky if you get a couple. So we need to get people into the profession, we need to incent them and once we're there, once they're in the door, we need to also be taking care of them to ensure that they'll stick around. This is this is a, a profession that's putting everything on the line for them. We need to respect them. We need to support them. Coming up on the uh, hour here, so this will have to be uh, the last question uh, today for the town hall. Do you support the bill to fund ALS research and caregiver support? Yes, I do wholeheartedly. You know, um, it's really a privilege to be able to be a co-author on one of these bills. The Senate just passed theirs. The house is taking ours up soon. Um, what a great way to invest money in much needed research in a disease that is absolutely devastating. Uh, the biggest income for research on, on this disease has been, has, the monies have been raised through uh, fundraisers like snowmobile rides, which is great, but you can't depend on a snowmobile ride to do the work that's needed to be done on researching such a devastating disease. And as we all have probably heard, um, our dear Senator Tomasoni, you know, is one who has struggled with this. Another, another labor champion off the range, uh, Dennis Frazier just lost his battle uh, last week with this disease. And um, it's horrible. And uh, I would, I'm proud to have my name on a bill that will invest money into the the research that we need. I believe that we can make improvements. I believe this is something that uh, we can do. And it's, it's, a, it's a great way to say thank you to two gentlemen, at least in my personal life, who've made such a huge investment on the range to the families, to the communities. Um, this is just a very small give back. Oh, I don't hear you. Oh, I had muted my mic there. Uh, apologies. I just want to say thanks for the opportunity to join you for this event this morning. Any closing comments that you have for folks or potentially uh, how to stay in touch with you? Absolutely. Thank you so much. First of all, I just want to say thank you again for joining me. I hope you will keep your eyes open on my e-updates and different things like that on Facebook. Um, I plan to do more of these moving forward, um, probably once a month. So keep your eyes peeled for those. Again, thank you for joining me. I think at the end of this um, event, you'll have a link, a survey to fill out. I sure would appreciate any feedback that you could give me on that. Um, and as far as like how to stay in, con in, in communication with me, stay in touch, please feel free to email me at rep, R-E-P, dot Julie, dot Sandstead, S-A-N-D-S-T-E-D-E, at house.mn. You can leave a message on my state Facebook page, um, or you can call my office 
and I will get back to you. I would love to hear from you, whatever, um, if I can help you, or if you have a question or concern about something, just feel free to reach out and I will, I will get back to you.